what I'd like to do now is maybe open this up to questions, comments. Um, again, what, I, what I've tried to do in all of these books is take the conversation beyond, um, you know, embrace the, uh, the flavor of it, embrace the nutritive value of local foods, embrace its impact on the environment, um, embrace the uh, political discussions around it, but also dial into that um, all of the, really the emotional component of what it means to share meals around a table when you've been intentional about where the food comes from and how it's prepared. So any comments, any questions? What are you guys doing? Yeah, I mean, what are you interested in? And, and, I'm, and I'd love to launch the discussion with any of that. Um, how does your, or how does Minnesota's local food scene compare to other states? Do we have um, a lot more of our population consuming these local foods, or how do we compare to others? You know, it's a great question. I think we do really well, and I think Wisconsin does too. And I also like to think of us as part of the Northern Heartland. When I started my work, my first book is called Savoring the Seasons with Lucia Watson, and that came out about 25 years ago. And to do that book, I had to work, or I, I began my research by talking to a really well-known demographer at the University of Minnesota, John Borchard who studied this area and called it the Northern Heartland because he recognized that our area, if you do a circle around it, that includes Wisconsin, Minnesota, Northern Iowa, parts of, um, uh, parts of Eastern, North and South Dakota, parts of Michigan, you know, you draw a circle around it, that um, that area is really much different than, say, Missouri and Kansas and other Southern regions that have, you know, they're, they're quite different from us. Um, and so up until that point, people kept considering the Midwest as this sort of swath. In fact, when I moved out here, my, my brother gave me this um, poster that um, had, you know, it was from the New Yorker, and it had New York taking up half the poster, and L.A. taking up the other half the poster, and it had a ribbon of the Mississippi in between, and, you know, everybody thought it was flyover land. Um, but we have, our, our region is super interesting for a number of reasons. Um, one, there are a lot of things that are indigenous that grow here really well on their own, they always have. Number two, we have had these waves of immigrants who have come here specifically to farm. They've come from farming communities, especially when, the, um, when this region was founded by the people that were growing wheat and then corn and dairy. They all came to farm. So they brought with them crops that tended to do well here, and they brought with them their foodways. And then, um, and then the weather is a huge factor. And all of those forces have really um, created um, for us, and we have really fertile soil. We have probably the world's richest soil. And I think it's our job to take care of the soil. Um, and as Wes Jackson, one of the researchers on this grain Kernza, will say, you know, this doesn't make sense. Because our, the chemicals and pesticides that are, we're using on, on our soil to grow these commodity crops are petroleum-based. And that is not a sustainable, replaceable fuel, right? But soil, you can build up soil. You can use the sun to grow these foods and you can compost them back into the soil and you can have green manure which is putting cover crop down right and you can you can take care of your soil and it will last you know for generations and generations and generations so are we going to you know continue to export to import this petroleum from people that hate us you know to dump on our fertile soil and burn it up or are we going to pay attention to our soil and take care of it and nurture it? Um, and that's why I wrote In Winter's Kitchen, because that's what these people are doing. They're paying attention to the soil. There's a lot of work being done um, that's supported by our land-grant universities, by the University of Minnesota and University of Wisconsin, where they have all of these test farms. There's one called an agroecology farm that's a permaculture farm in Finland, Minnesota, that's getting all kinds of attention. It's a satellite project that's going to be built out in these other outreaches in northern Minnesota where um, they don't have any local food. So they're trying to reclaim their local food system. They had it at one point, but they're using a lot of, um, 
there, in fact, that's what uh, Robin Kimmer does in Braiding Sweetgrass. She talks about weaving together this indigenous wisdom and understanding of how plants work naturally and understanding how nature's systems work and then using the technology that we have and the science we have to marry the two together to begin to address some of the issues that can bring us into a more vibrant future. So how do we begin to build out a food economy that feeds people in farm country? And, um, and there's a wonderful uh, little town, Amboy, um, just south on 169, where a young woman who got tired of living in the cities returned and opened up a cafe, started sourcing from her neighbors, and has built up this fabulous little cafe, really good local food. And it's gotten more people to start growing and selling food to her. And eventually, they now have a farmer's market. And they're working on putting in a co-op. So you know, again, it's, it's communities deciding that that's of value and willing to spend time and energy to make that happen. I was just up in Finland, Minnesota. And that's where that agroecology thing is. And they have a really good farmer's market now. And they just built a big community center. And they have a community potluck every month where people bring you know, they share dinners. And in a town of 400, somebody told me about 200 show up every every month for those potlucks. So I think a lot of it is just is tightening, you know, like working at it at the local level, working really hard at it at the local level and being really, again, really intentional about it. And I found, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, you all are a little bit younger than, than I have adult children. And um, they're pretty into this. You know, they like growing food. They all like to cook. I have to confess that my sons all realized that, you know, cooking was pretty good chick bait. You know, they could, you know, have girls over and, and uh, impress them. Right? So it's fun, you know. And I think it also, I mean, we're all, we spend so much time behind computers and on our cell phones and texting and all of that kind of stuff that there's nothing more satisfying than working with your hands.